Good afternoon, everybody. The noonday gun in Cape Town has gone off. Uh, that's, that's where our studio is based. Thank you for joining us and welcome to REI Talk. It's our weekly investment webinar brought to you by a Real Estate Investor. Uh, it is now webinar and virtual event season for REI until the end of November. So please ensure that you stay until the end of the webinar to get all the dates of the webinars that's going to run through till end of November. So today is our third webinar in a three-part series sponsored by Opportunity Private Capital. Uh, my name is Neil Peterson. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Real Estate Investor, and we've been serving investors, entrepreneurs, business, and property professionals in the South African residential and commercial real estate industry for over 14 years already. And that's through our multiple content platforms, including Remag, our digital magazine, our online content, virtual conferences, webinars, videos, and podcasts. And I'm really excited to be your host and moderator for this investment webinar today. So today's topic is the great real estate debate, alternative investments versus physical investment, changing the game for private investors to invest now. Alternative investments versus physical investments and where to invest now. So we know that a large contingent of active investors will always invest in real estate. Uh, it has proven itself many times over as a solid investment. The question is always what asset class or category of real estate to invest in first? Physical property or alternative investments? Where do you invest? Local or offshore? Niche or broad markets? and which category. They all have their pros and cons for different types of investors under different circumstances. And the key for investors is the ability to access and acquire a continuous stream of attractive assets with really good returns. So the key is also to take action when the opportunity does present itself. And today we will hopefully be exposed to some of those opportunities. And we will discuss all of those aspects and we invite you to participate in this debate. So without further ado, I'd like you to meet our panelists for today. First of all, Nick Morgan, he's the CEO and co-founder of Opportunity Private Capital. Nick, can you please introduce yourself to the attendees, please? As long as I've unmuted myself, I think uh, that's all good. Yes, you have. Neil, good, good to see you. <laughs> Um, yes. and, and really good to see Scott as well. It's been a while and he's, he's always such a mine of useful info that um, this is going to be a great discussion. So hi, hi Scotty. Nice to see you. Um, my name is, is Nick Morgan. I'm one of the founders of Opportunity Private Capital. Uh, we were founded in 2006. And in short, we're a very niche investment company uh, where we, we fund residential property developments. And in the last seven years or so, we've focused our attention just in the greater Cape Town area. And we've been achieving really good returns for investors over that time. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you guys today. Fantastic. Great to have you on board, Nick. And Scott, it's uh, great to see you. I know you're world traveler, being you the CEO of Global Wealth Group. And uh, we always see you in some or other country on social media and you moving and shaking. Introduce yourself, please, to the, uh, to the attendees. No, Neil, thanks very much for having us online. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation between Nick, yourself and myself. We've all, <clears throat> we've all known each other for a long time, uh, been doing this for a long time. So we've all got different perspectives, which I think is going to be brilliant. I'm actually coming from a little town called Vitsant, which is on the Breda River mouth, halfway <laughs> between Nisner and, and Cape Town. So it's definitely not international and it's not scintillating, but it is school <laughs> holidays. Um, however, I will say... I spent five weeks in Europe recently and uh, between Switzerland, Italy, France and England. And the first world is coming back to life. Uh, it is fantastic to see that COVID is almost a thing of the past where people are generally vaccinated. You're going to restaurants, trains, public transport. And most importantly, you're not wearing masks. So I keep getting into trouble in South Africa for walking into shops and restaurants without a mask because after five weeks <laughs> of not wearing a mask, I got used to living like that again. So. Anyway, a bit of a light on the horizon for all of us as to where the world is going um, in, in the right direction, which, which is quite nice. Although I am getting a tremendous amount of humor out of watching England have no petrol. 
because uh, when we had the riots in July, there were all those hashtags, pray for South Africa, and I'm having fun sending them messages, pray for England. But anyway, that's, that's on the human side. <laughs> I think a nice one. Pray for their rugby team as well. So anyway, but that's uh, great Great having you on board, Scott and, and Nick. And uh, so Nick, we're going to kick uh, Neil, in straight. Neil, Neil, just a quick yep. uh, intro. Sorry, I didn't give an intro. I gave it, uh, I told where I was from in the world. But uh, yeah, look, in simple terms, We've been helping people invest in property uh, for nearly 20 years now. Um, I did my first international investment in 1999, so it's 22 years ago. Um, helped thousands of people invest in South Africa, England, Australia, and America. But more importantly, I've been fascinated my whole life on how technology can be used to make the process a lot safer and simpler. Uh, we started to build a platform from 2010 called Wealth Migrate. And we went live in 2013. And today we've got members in 168, uh, sorry, now it's actually 170 countries around the world. Uh, we facilitated over a billion dollars, uh, 1.1 to be exact, um, worth of real estate uh, deals around the world. And what we're really excited about is working with quality partners, giving people access so that they can participate in those investments, but most importantly, making it safe and simple for people. Um, and we'll obviously talk about that in a lot more detail, but technology tends to do that. You know, it cuts out the middleman, it cuts the costs, and it dramatically increases the trust, the transparency, and the accessibility. And, and that's what I'm truly excited about, you know, quality partners and allowing investors access. Excellent. And great to have you on board, Scott, as always. And yeah, and I can see how you get excited about the whole technology thing. So am I. Okay, so Nick, we're going to start off with you. And just don't forget to unmute yourself this time, Nick, as well. Um, I want you to just set the scene so that you can give us a brief overview, first of all, of your investment offering. What does it entail uh, and what is currently available for investors to invest in? And obviously you in the alternative space. And I know in our previous uh, webinars that we had a lot of questions came out at the end in terms of this. So we're deciding to do this right up front to let people know exactly what the investment is. So I'm going to ask you to, to take us through a, a brief overview on that, Dave. Uh, so over to you, Nick. Yeah, Neil, thanks. So, um, okay, you, you've mentioned alternative investments. Yeah, we fall squarely into that category. So thanks, that sums it up nicely. Um, I think it's important to, to lay the, the ground work, so to speak, to give people a bit of background about what we do. So if you'll indulge me, I think I'll just bring up a short hopefully just a five minute presentation that I'll run through, which should give people a fair idea about um, broad strokes about what we do. And, and also to uh, show, we want people to take action. I think that's, uh, that's something that you generally like to see people doing. So we're going to showcase one of our available investments as well that people can take action on. So uh, if you'll indulge me, um, let's see if I can get this, this presentation to work now. Yeah, I'm sure you can. Can you see it? Not yet. We can't. Now we can. Okay, the screen is coming up, Nick. We can see your, your PowerPoint screen. Right, there we go. <laughs> okay, great. So Excellent. hopefully it'll be, it'll be quick enough not to be death by PowerPoint. So let's, um, <laughs> let's go through this. So just to, just to recap, um, you know, we're a boutique investment company mm -hmm. founded in 2006. We operate under FSP license 13370, which means we, we're regulated by the FSCA. And we located um, in Edward Street in Cape Town near the Tiger Valley Center. We've actually been there for over 15 years. So we are, you know where to find us from a bricks and mortar point of view, that's for sure. Um, in short, what we do is we provide secure investments for private investors to earn pretty decent fixed returns on their capital by funding residential property development. So that's the, that's the important thing to note, is the funding of, of residential property developments. Um, and these developments then serve as the underlying investment vehicle that generates these investors' returns. So if investors can, can form a picture about how that might look. Um, the minimum investment in our case is usually 100,000 Rand. Um, just a bit of background, you know, we've, in terms of private capital invested, we're actually, this is a bit data, we're over the 200 million mark at the moment, um, with a total projects value pushing half a billion. 
Um, and the thing to note, which I think is vital, is if we just take the last five years as a snapshot in time, our investment performance, we've averaged seven, just over 17% a year, which is really good, especially considering current investment conditions. And this is through multiple projects, multiple investment cycles, et cetera. Um, just a word about our strategy, Neil, which I think people might find useful. And we, we're quite rigid about this. Um, the first thing is that um, we offer fixed annual returns. We, we set out looking to offer people some predictability about their investment, and it helps the funding of the projects as well. Um, second, very important point is that investors get all the security that's available to protect their capital. And this is a really important thing to note is that there is no external funding other than with private investors and ourselves. So there's no institutional funding, et cetera. So developers literally get all the available security to protect their, their capital. Um, we tend to maintain a pretty good retention rate of clients from one investment to the cycle to the next. And currently we're hovering at about 85%, which obviously makes us happy because we're keeping our existing investors um, pretty, pretty happy. Part of our strategy, as mentioned in the introduction, about seven years ago, we decided to focus on projects in the greater Cape Town area only. Um, just We just thought the fundamentals in Cape Town were better from a property point of view. We just felt that the local governance was better and that's where we set our stall. Um, and to take that an extra yard is that we focus on high demand areas in Cape Town and the middle income sector. So we want high absorption rates of properties we don't go for the high income or high, high end properties at all. And the last thing in terms of that strategy is we focused, and I said rigidly before, on small to medium sized gated complexes. The bigger the project, the longer the time frame, the more the complexity, the higher the risk. So we tend to keep it very controlled um, to a reasonable size. And in terms of um, you know, cornerstones of the business and also benefits to the invest, investor in a, in, a, in a broad manner. One is the asset-backed capital protection, which I've just alluded to. Of course, attractive fixed returns, um, averaging over 17% per annum the last five years, as I said, is, is, is great. It's a good benefit. But the predictability is something that people don't really think about. If with our fixed returns and our predictable timeframes, it gives investors a hell of a good idea about how their investment's going to perform, which makes their future planning a lot easier. And I think that's, that's a really good benefit. And the other thing, especially in the South African context, Neil, South Africans mm. are reticent to think too far ahead of teams, um, given, right. given what goes on in the country. So yeah. um, our investment periods are short to medium terms. Um, they're not yeah. locked in for very long. So you're, you're not locked in in terms of liquidity issues for too long. And yeah. our average investment term is about 15 months. Something to consider as well is, Neil, you spoke about physical investment versus alternative. And the great thing about this type of investment is that instead of buying a property where you're right at the end of the project, you're actually getting early access to the development. You're coming into the development phase where the value is being extracted. Um, and that's allowed for these consistent returns over a prolonged period. And OPC... Um, we're part of a group that controls and, and manages the whole development supply and value chain. And that in, no, eliminates external parties that could create some risk in the business. So from funding to development, to the project management, to the construction, the sales, it's in a very controlled environment, which has served us incredibly well. Um, I don't want to go into the detail of the flow of funds and the capital protection, given our time constraints, and it's quite convoluted, but certainly we can discuss it later if someone requests as such. Okay, and then perfect. Finally, Neil, just, just a bit onto what we've actually got to offer. So sorry to... Uh, no, no, please do. We'd like, I think we want to get this out up front because we yeah. did have a lot of questions. I just want to emphasize that to the audience you know, yeah. on the type of investment. So it's important to get this out up front. So, yeah, so, so we've got two really good projects on the go at the moment, both in the, in the northern suburbs of Cape Town. This is the Heron Fields project in Langenberg Ridge, just outside of um, Durbanville. Um, and this investment cycle is currently open as we speak. Um, 
minimum investment 100,000. The fixed returns are from 14 to 18 percent per annum, and that's dependent on how much you invest. They are investment tiers depending on your quantum of investment. The status of the project is we're busy with the installation of services, as you saw in the previous um, image. Um, and the funding required for this cycle is 16.8 million. And in no time at all, we've got to 12.2 million. We really yes. are motoring on this, which is which is great to see That's in fantastic. the current climate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Another project, mm. another project that we've that's on the go is called the Indolini Development. That's in Brackenfell in Cape Town. There's an image of uh, we're already on on the slabs on the first floor, so that's going quite well. Um, that's 61 units apartment complex. The previous investment cycle was fully subscribed, and the next cycle is only open in November. Um, and where we are at the moment is the construction of phase one units. And nice to know for the investors is how the investments get generated is obviously the sale of the property. And the first phase of 24 units of the 61 is already sold out. And we, we've only just started the building of those, of those units. So going well at the moment, um, Neil, and thanks for indulging me. Um, no, excellent. That presentation. Good, good way to set the scene. And, uh, and I, I think you also answered uh, one of the questions that came in from Francis. Uh, in particular, she wanted to know what the usual locking period is, and I think you've shared that with us now. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that uh, in particular. Yeah. yeah, Neil, it's 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 around our average over over the course of of seven or so years is fifteen months, but the usual period, the next cycle is around about twelve months. Um, it is it is based on sales and project timelines, so it's not an exact science, but we're not far off um, our predetermined markers usually. Okay, excellent. Great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to you, Nick, because we, yep. this is the great real estate debate, by the way, because you're doing it local, you're doing it Cape Town, um, yep. you're very, you're hyper-focused in that area. And Nick, you guys operate in a niche sector focused on investable projects in the greater Cape Town region only and this also pertains to what Francis are are these investment opportunities only in Cape Town and why are you so bullish about the Cape in particular as an investable area well I've heard from some billionaires it's because it's DA run and you know this is not a political conversation but they've got a clean audit and uh, so they do have a track record of running successful municipalities that's got to be one of the one of the reasons to invest in. So do you want to just elaborate a bit on that, Nick? Yeah, Neil, um, I'm, I'm not a billionaire, um, but I am bullish about, I am bullish about- <laughs> You're close. <laughs> bullish about the Cape as an investment, as an investment destination. Look, we have been for a while, which I alluded to earlier, but going forward, um, we're predicting that, that Cape Town is going to go through a really good run. And um, for, for some of the reasons, and obviously semigration, is happening in, in volume as we speak. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence and other evidence to show that. Um, for example, you know, I'll, I'll just, if you indulge me again, I've just got some stats that you might wanna see, but um, you know, one of the um, heads of one of the private schools in the Cape said that 30% of their admissions this year are from Gauteng for the kids. That's a massive number. Um, yeah. One of the local banks um, has said that over 500 of their private wealth clients have moved down and are in the process of moving down from Gauteng to the Cape. Massive number if you look at it in that context. So Neil, we are bullish about the Cape. I just want to go into some of the reasons why, because I think that's important. And then maybe that'll open up some, some questions sure. and answers. So Absolutely. I'll share a screen again, if you don't mind. No problem. Um, yeah, and look, according to Neil, can you see that? Yes, we just yeah. need to put on full screen. Um, there we go. Okay, you probably yeah, look, it. according to CIF as well, I mean, the most popular city to relocate to is, is Cape Town, although I don't think that's, that's a huge surprise. But just, I mean, some of the reasons, yes, there's semigration, and semigration is obviously going to increase, um, help the economy. It's going to increase opportunity uh, opportunities for investment. But why? What's the, that's the, I think the question you're asking, Neil, is why is the Cape 
a good investable destination. So one is obviously the local government report shows that uh, most of the well-run municipalities are in the Cape. If we look at audit results of, of 2019-20, <clears throat> confirms that the Western Cape is the top performing province in SA. I mean, even the Auditor General, and I think probably hard to get them to say anything. Um, he actually says, and I'll quote, um, he says on the Western Cape achievements in his report, this was achieved during a troubled 2020 with disruptions to normal operations by leadership setting a strong tone at the top to maintain a sound control environment. So it's just perceived to have a, a good infrastructure, good quality of life and less crime. And then Neil, really interesting as well about the Cape. I mean, recently it's just been awarded um, Cape Town as the number one city in Africa and Middle East by the Travel and Leisure Awards, uh, which you probably know about. Um, but this is right up Scott Street. Scott was talking about tech. Scott is, is putting people all around the world in touch with investments due to, due to utilization of technology. And Cape Town is now recognized as Africa's tech capital. And just last year, it attracted over a billion in technology investment. Um, and that's in a, in a bad year. So, and little known fact, Cape Town Stock Exchange is opening on the 1st of October. Heck, that's tomorrow. Yeah. We haven't yes. had that since, since 1912, I believe. Um, yeah. So it's been over a century since there was a stock exchange in Cape Town. And it's going to be very focused on tech stocks, as I understand it, which is, which is good to see. Um, according to Financial Times, the Financial Times group, Cape Town is one of the world's fastest growing region, re regions for foreign direct investment. Heck, I didn't know that. Um, before this research came away. So this is, these are, these are great things to, to see, Neil. Um, just from, this is the last thing I'll say because I'm going on a bit, but just from- um, <laughs> Scott just, is just, dying to, to put his word in there. <laughs> I, can, I can see that. Um, just from an economic point of view, um, you know, the Western Cape unemployment rate, 17% lower than the rest of the country. So if you're looking at opportunities in a niche sector, hell, this is it. Um, for sure. And then I think you'll find these graphs pretty interesting. So these are, these are projected um, stats on, let's call it the GDP of Western Cape versus South Africa over the next five years. <clears throat> I, won't, I won't elaborate into the numbers, but you can see the Western Cape is safely double in terms of going forward, um, double the rest of the country. And then the last thing I'll say on this is that if you compare Western Cape, South Africa, UK and US, the Western Cape, which is in blue, it's looking pretty good, you know, from a, from a projected point of view. Um, and so I think those looking to uh, put, set their stall up in the Cape, it's, it's not a bad call because the, the numbers are alluding to that. And Neil, well, I'll, I'll let Scott well, jump the, in there. That's the knockout sucker punch for uh, Scott Pickin over there. Because listen, ladies and gents, this is the great real estate debate. Don't forget that. So, and I think Nick has made a very strong argument for investment in the Cape. And I agree with you, Nick, uh, in terms of the Western Cape. I mean, when I interviewed Hans Otterling and uh, Carl Somelli, they investing specifically in tech companies based in the Western Cape. They're not looking outside of that. They're looking in the Cape. So that is really something that is uplifting. The investor into the Cape Town uh, Stock Exchange is also a billionaire who's investing in an airport in the northern suburb. So that's all fantastic. But this is the great real estate debate. And we've got Scott Pickin on the other side. And Scott, you, uh, for years, you're operating in a dynamic sector. First of all, it's fintech. It's, you know, it's prop tech. And you've been pushing offshore investment for many years. And uh, so maybe you can tell us your offering. Uh, Nick has put his on the table. Tell us from your perspective and convince us that offshore is the way to go or maybe both together. Just a quick question before I go there. Um, Nick, did I read your graphs right that that was saying that the UK is gonna grow by 7% next year? Because uh, don't. that doesn't really make sense to me. As in, I don't see the UK growing by seven percent. Just, I just wanted to check there quickly because, um, um, yeah, I, 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 I was just, I, I presume I probably read it wrong. To be honest, I, I love no. the graphs, by the way. You, um, you, you didn't. You didn't. Um, luckily, luckily, I don't come up with the stats. I don't have to defend it too much myself. But I think, I think it's because it's coming off a hell of a low base, Scott. Remember, 
year on year growth is is what happened the previous year so i think it's year on year growth not seven percent growth because like that's sort of china stats and i was just i was wondering that. no no it's obviously it, it's obviously going to be based upon prior year performance and and the uk was obviously muddled like the rest of the world gotcha. answer your question <laughs> yeah, no, perfect. No, sorry, I just, I just want to understand it. No, excellent, Neil. So, look, I think, I think, really, for me, the, the, the way I'm going to start is that I believe that that it should, you know, the the, kind of the 20th century was about either or thinking, and what that meant is, should I invest locally? Should I invest internationally? It was very much either or thinking. Um, probably the commentator that I follow the most at the moment in the financial space is a gentleman called Ray Dalio, and um, if you haven't checked him out. He, he's got an amazing book called Principles, and he talks a lot and has done over the last 18 months, you know, based on the crisis of where we're at. But we're not just in a crisis because of COVID. A lot of people think we're in a crisis because of COVID. We're not. We're in a long-term debt cycle. We're in a popular populism cycle. And when one looks at all the long-term trends, and I'm talking 100-year-plus trends here, we're at an epicenter of change that's going to happen in the next couple of years. And the only way for an investor to navigate that change is through diversification. And as Ray Dalio says, you need to diversify across countries, assets, currencies, and partners. And so what I want to, what I want to share with you is that where I believe we never, ever had the opportunity because previously a guy like Ray Dalio would come along and he would say that. Now, he's worth... Um, uh, uh, about 16 billion, as I understand it, his fund is, is worth over 160 billion. And what's really interesting is that a gentleman like that would come along and they would give us advice, but the average investor just wouldn't be able to participate because to invest in multiple different assets in multiple countries, you know, people just didn't have the capital. What we've done with technology is allow people access to the best quality partners. And we've got the USA, the UK and Australia on the slide. We recently launched uh, Europe, and I'm quite excited to say that South Africa is coming live um, in the next month or two as well. And, and, and so really our, our, our objective is to go out and find partners just like Nick and the guys at Opportunity that are localized, understand exactly what they're doing. The one thing when it comes to real estate, in my opinion, is that it'll always be a local game. You're never going to be a global expert on real estate. You know, when it comes to the Western Cape, I would far rather be investing in opportunity that has local expertise, understands their niche market, and is going to execute on their niche market. They're just trying rather than trying to be a global player and invest all over the world, because that's the fastest way to lose money, because real estate is a local game. But what technology can do is bridge the gap between the localization and global access. And so what we do is we make it fairly simple. We get access to good quality curated partners. And what's really important here is that it's in a regulated space. So in South Africa, we were one of the first companies to get our equity crowdfunding license um, in South Africa. We've got a CAT 1 license, but we've also um, under a CAT 2 license, which allows us, um, our partner, our chief investment officer, to do discretionary uh, funds. Now, why that's important is that you're dealing in a fully regulated space. We've also got our wallet providers who are third party provider out of Europe. And so our investors are protected when they invest internationally by European regulation. And it's uh, our European providers, the biggest digital wallet provider in, in Europe. They've got 6 million wallets. So you've got your money where you're investing around the world. You don't, uh, Neil, I know you've done this with me. Nick, I can't remember if you and I've done this, but where you fly over to America and you try and set up a company and set up a bank account, it's an absolute bloody dog show. And that's before you even start to buy a property. And, and now with technology, you can literally do it all online from the comfort of your couch, but also know that your money is being protected in, in Europe. Now in South Africa, we're about to launch our digital South African wallets in, in November. And equally, it's, it's with one of the most trusted financial institutions in this country. So it's really important that you're not dealing with a local lawyer's trust account, but you're actually dealing with a digital wallet provider where you're completely in control of your cash. The next thing that is important is that when you actually partner with these curated partners, we deal, and, and from a due diligence perspective, we try and look at people that have only been in the market for a long time. So generally 10 years plus, they're putting their own money into the deal and they're also niche focused. So you're getting quality partners from around the world, both locally in South Africa and internationally, where you can get access uh, to those partners. And then the final thing that I think is, is important is that 
or sorry, two things that are important. Often those partners aren't in a regulated space. They they property in you know developers or sponsors, and they 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 what they're good at is executing on a property investment. But we bring them into the regulated space, um, and that's got a full financial services component um, where the SPVs, the special purpose vehicles, are protected in the regulated environment, etc. So that's really 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 important. Now what they do once they've passed the due diligence test, they actually list on the platform. And then you and I as global investors get access uh, to those investments. Now, what, what's equally important is that the old school way of doing things was very much an assets under management type model or private equity type model. And really it wasn't in their interest. The, the, the fees are not aligned. Even, a, even a, a traditional kind of broker agent model is not aligned because they make a good amount of fees on the front end, but they're not aligned with the results. Whereas us as investors, and I'd like to use the analogy of Airbnb, you know, I've got properties on Airbnb and through COVID, Airbnb made no money out of me because they only make money when they make me money. Our business model with the investors is exactly the same. So it's a transaction based um, fee where we make money when they make money. And it's really important that with our partners, be it Opportunity or anyone else, that, that the investors' interests are aligned with the partner and with the platform because then you're going to get the long term success. And then finally, for you and I as investors, we get to go and actually participate. So if I show you very quickly how that would work, there's four simple steps. You sign up, you complete your investment, you fund your wallet, and you invest. And if I show you, I'm just going to show you a PowerPoint here because it's a little bit easier, but you would literally go in, you would uh, sign up just, just the same way as any other platform. You would then go and choose the country that you're from and the type of investor that you are. It has an impact on the quality um, of um I know that you asked a, a panel or a poll now, Neil, in terms of the sophistication of investor, it does impact uh, which investments would be available to you. You then go in and you actually verify your account and complete your profile. And through this process, it's, it's an online process. You upload your documents. And, you know, KYC, know your clients, and AML, which is money laundering, is a frustrating process, but it is a, a, a global a mandatory process. The nice thing is you only have to do it once. Once you've done it, it's like setting up, you know, any any type of financial account. Once it's done, it's done. Then you go in and you can effectively upload everything. It's all online, so you're in complete control of this process. The next step is sending fu funds to your wallet. So you, you again, it's your wallet. You're in complete control of it. You send your money, whether you want to do this locally in rands or whether you know with with our South African digital wallets coming whether you want to do it internationally into dollars and next year we'll have pounds and euros coming where you can effectively invest into a digital wallet. You can truly diversify around the world and get all your returns uh, back into one place. And then finally, the last part, which for me gets exciting is where you can actually go and browse um, the, the internet and, or, or the marketplace. And I'm going to do that live because I prefer to look at this, but if you go into our platform now, you can look, you know, we've, we've had, um, we've just had a, a Hobbs deal at an industrial. So logistics is one of the most um, productive real estate investment classes around the world, particularly with COVID. We just had an industrial logistics park. Uh, this was another industrial park. This was a multifamily in America, but you can see here also with multiple different partners. This was another industrial park. This was an office park. So where the world is, is changing now and, and how office space is changing. And you talk about semigration, Nick, and I completely agree with you. I live in Neisner. The amount of people that have moved to Neisner, what they call Zoom towns is phenomenal. Um, but equally, people are leaving New York and Chicago and they're moving to Fort Lauderdale, which is you know Florida for lifestyle and, and a whole bunch of other reasons. It's one of the wealthiest places. And this was John Robbie, the gentleman behind uh, Century City. They're doing a development in Portugal. So you can quite, quite quickly see the caliber of partners that people can get access to. And then finally, when you go into any one of the deals, what we do do is we try and standardize it so that it's easy. Because if you're looking at different deals all over the place, it becomes quite difficult to kind of see. So you can see all the different returns. You can see the, you know, um, you can see the risk profiles. You can read through the documentation. There's a returns calculator, which I love most, which is all about the transparency and fees. People can see exactly what it is. You can see the risks. The milestones and then you can go and read all about the investments the sponsors the due diligence uh etc the last thing i wanted to say before i'm before i hand back to you neil and nick is that this is an opportunity we haven't been in australia for a while 
Australia went through, you know, I've, I actually wrote a book that was endorsed by Clem Sunter uh, back in 2014 called Property Going Global. And I feel very strongly that no market is the perfect market. And that's why, Nick, I was asking you about London because it's, it, or England at the 7%, because I always find it fascinating when people say to me, London's the best place to invest and it has been for 50 years or whatever. And I'm like, that's rubbish because there's no good market that's a good market forever. Um, yeah. and, and markets go in cycles. Now, Australia was a classic example. We were investing in Australia uh, in 2009, 2010. It was the best performing market in the G20. But what's really interesting is we're bringing an opportunity uh, to the market in the next week or so, which is co-living. And this, you know, it's interesting. Brisbane has just won the Olympics for 2032. And if you look at Sydney, it had a huge growth in, in what took place. Uh, in the 10 years prior to the Olympics. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail today. We, we, this will all go live on the platform in the next couple of days. But co-living is one of the most economically resilient sectors in Europe during COVID. Now, I have to say, when I first, when I first looked into it, Jonathan, just be careful with the noise. Um, when, uh, when I first looked into the space, I would have thought co-living wouldn't have really worked because you know with COVID, people don't want to be together. But actually, if you're in your... Kind of 25 to 40 you want to live in common environments you want to be have open spaces you want to be able to live work and play that that terrible saying that everyone uses and it was one of the most economic uh economically resilient um portfolios in europe it's subsequently become a, a really positive uh trend in australia because affordability is such an issue in australia and you and i pretty much everyone listening to this webinar that is not an australian citizen cannot invest in australia yet you can participate in this opportunity that's coming uh, to the table. So for, for me, if, if people are interested, what I think is really important is that, you know, go along to wealthmigrate.com. You can literally sign up. The different deals come. The last thing I wanted to say, though, is that the world is changing and the world is changing so fast. And, you know, if you look at in, in America at the moment, there are platforms like CrowdStreet. And actually, I can share a quick document here. Um, and, and Nick and, and, and Neil, I, was, I literally got this this morning, so I can share this with you as well. But it's absolutely fascinating what is happening in America with CrowdStreet. And if you look down the bottom here somewhere, I can't remember the exact number, but they, they're going to raise a billion dollars uh, this year online. And what they're basically talking about is that private equity investment is, is changing completely in America. And I mean, there's a whole article in terms of where it's going, the size of the market. Um, and everything else. You can see a 640 million worth of invested capital in 2020, and they're due to go over a billion dollars in, in 2021. Now, the one thing I'll say is that South Africa is quite a long way behind. Uh, the equity crowdfunding regulations came out in America in 2013, so we're the best part of seven to eight years behind. But I think that partners like Opportunity are going to get not only local access, but global access as um, now the regulation has finally come into play. We worked with a regulator in this country for 10 years. It's finally there. And so, um, Nick, I love what you said about the Western Cape. I live in the Western Cape. I don't have to live in the Western Cape. I have a British and Irish passport. I could live anywhere I want in the world. I choose to live in the Western Cape. And I look forward to putting you know, companies like yourselves on the global scale and the Western Cape on the global scale and allowing technology to do that. Excellent. <clears throat> I think so. We, you're watching the great real estate debate here. Yeah? I think Nick has given a fantastic argument. So is Scott. And I think we can see on both sides there is massive opportunity, but I think there's also strong fundamentals in both of their arguments. And I think I just want to come back to Nick quickly because I've, 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 we've got a lot of questions to get through and I know time is running out. So we also want to give people the opportunity at the end to kind of take action on this. And I think, Scott, you brought up a lot of things. That's where our Springboks are sitting at the moment. They're in Brisbane and hopefully they take out the All Blacks tomorrow. And, uh, you know, they've, they've lived there for over a month already, you know, and sometimes not in, in very trying circumstances in uh, a country that is the nanny state that controls everything. But, uh, but they, yes, and I like what you say about there's not a good place to invest, but we need to find those pockets. So, Nick, I want to come back to you, right? And I just encounter what Scott brought up, and he brought up some, a lot of relevant trends, you know, from this immigration, which is actually an international trend, and uh, co-living spaces, which is also an international trend, also moving fast in South Africa. That's where it's all moving, and that's what COVID has, has created. It's sharing economies. So, Nick, from your perspective, 
right up front, Scott mentioned the diversification argument. And I want you to briefly answer that. I know we have to get to quite a lot in terms of counter where you're at from a real estate investment perspective. What are your thoughts just around that? So, I mean, what 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 Scott said is absolutely true. I think I think one needs diversification, but as an investor, one needs some diversification. So, if you look at it from an investment point of view, you say, okay, I say. If, if you can afford to put some money offshore, you're going to put some money offshore. Unfortunately, given the weakness of the RAND, it's, it's, it's kind of prohibitive to a certain extent because a lot of people don't have that, um, that capacity and even less people have the capacity, obviously, to emigrate. So, and diversifying in different, um, in different investment sectors is also good. But Scott mentioned something really important, and that's that we as the guys who are actually generating the investment, we should be niche because we are the guys who need to set our stall out in an environment that we understand, an environment that we can control to as large an extent as possible, and one where we think the outcomes are gonna be good, which is why, as I said to earlier, we're in the Western Cape. We see that it's got loads of potential and we go on to Let's talk about, I can't remember who said within, within chaos, there's opportunity, but um, South Africa is a generally chaotic business environment at the moment. I don't think anyone's going to uh, contradict that. However, within that, there are pockets of opportunity and that's exactly where we are. We in a pocket, a high, high performing area um, that, that will be to continue for some time if, if um, I would say if the Western Cape manages to get through this, uh, let's call it the municipal elections in one piece, um, there's going to be a lot of investment coming to the Cape. So just to finish off that, as an investor, certainly diversify, but as people who are generating the investment, like ourselves, keep it niche where you've got control that you understand. And just to one, one step, people always, they ask me all the time, Nick, you guys are in residential. Why don't you go into industrial? Why don't you go into commercial? And the simple fact of the matter is we've been in residential for a hell of a long time. We understand it. Our entire team are residential experts. That's the best way we can control it. So we can perform best for our investors by staying in that particular space. Um, awesome. So I don't know if that answers your diverse no, question at all. No, no, absolutely. I think, perfect, Nick. I think there's some powerful arguments. And what I do like over here, you know, toing and fraying is that, you know, the, you've got the gloves out. I mean, this is the, the great real estate debate, right? So, of course, we've got to punt what we think is best. And I think both are best. And I don't think there's one. There's, there's every investor for, you know, there's different types of investment, different things that you select. Scott, I'm going to bring you in over here. And it's from Warren. It's a question because we've got quite a few questions to get through here, guys. It's uh, while I'm already a huge supporter of wealth migrates and continue to invest in various deals, a question for you, Scott, which may be covered through the discussion. Would you recommend holding a physical asset along with the wealth migrate portfolio? And yes, I know you're not a financial advisor. So just an opinion and an insight would be appreciated. Yeah, so look, I think um, I've got I've got two or three comments here. Firstly, just back to Nick's uh, focus thing. I love that, Nick, and that's exactly what we look for in partners. You know, the person that's trying to be residential, commercial, industrial, and run a shopping center on the side is looking for a hiding. And if anyone's read uh, all the all the chaos that's going in uh, in China at the moment, and yes. I can send some Evergrande, yeah, you know, with Evergrande. You know, mm. it's I can send some interesting articles around that, but I mean, I would put one of them down to trying to be in too, do too many things in too many places, and you know, but being an octopus all over the place and, and ultimately failing. Um, so that's my first point. My second point, I think, is really important is that I agree with Nick in terms of being able to invest overseas traditionally. And funny enough, I put an article in there, an interesting article about the REITs, because traditionally the only way people could invest was through the stock market, where you could invest small amounts of money. To invest but you know they, they're hurting badly and their returns are, are you know are, are, are showing that and and now with technology you can now participate from far smaller amounts so our minimum investment on the platform now is a hundred dollars um, we haven't finalized what the minimum will be in south africa 
but I would like to think it's going to be in the range of about a thousand rand. And you know, even even that allows people to participate in in opportunities. Opportunities, <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> if you know, the minimum is a hundred thousand. And what I love with technology is it just makes it much more accessible. So you know, I I I'd like to think that the technology is removing those barriers to entry. Back to Warren's question. Yes, let, let's just be very clear. I'm not a financial advisor, and this is the great real estate <laughs> debate, and, and, it, and it always comes down to each individual. So. I had a, 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 a person recently that I um, was talking to. They had a house in Plett and they had a house in London and, in, and uh, they wanted to sell their, they, they, they had the ride, they panicked. They wanted to sell their house in London. Sorry, they wanted to sell their house in Plett. They wanted to sell their house in, 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 in Kensington, London, because it's too small. Now they wanted to buy another house. And I, I, I just took, and I just did all the models. And I said, look, if you own a house in Plett, cash, and you own a house in Kensington, cash, like it's it's financial suicide okay because you could be getting far better returns on top of that to sell those properties just outright and to incur all the costs i did the maths they were looking at like 11 to 13 percent in in literally lost costs between agents and stamp duty and transfer fees and all that sort of stuff so i want to come back to your to, to warren's question nick which is it depends and it depends very much on on what someone's looking at because if you go into that story in a little more detail they love going to Plett. They love living in Plett. So why not um, consider a different alternative where they remortgage the property, they take 50% of the equity out from the bank, they own it 100%. Um, they invest that capital overseas, or maybe they invest it with opportunity, whatever. But the point is they invest it somewhere that it's getting a return. Um, and, and then they only have to short-term let their property out for three weeks a year, and it'll pay the full mortgage for the year. So now they have a house for free for 11 months, and, they, and they're investing their capital. Now, for me, that's what I call creative thinking. To, to, it's not either or thinking. So back to Warren's question, if I understood it correctly, do you own a fixed asset? Do you own you know, alternative assets? Do you invest in opportunity? Do you invest offshore? I would always argue with everyone, like find yourself good investments, find things that are gonna make sense to you. Don't make decisions based on gut feel. Use financial numbers and systems to be able to compare an apple with an apple. And most importantly, you know, the last thing I'll say is if it comes down to a physical asset, sometimes people, it's a home, okay? And the one thing that I learned through Robert Kiyosaki and many of the others is that your home is not an investment. And so don't kid yourself that your home is, is an investment. It's a home. It's something that gives you peace of mind. It's, it's a place. So I don't know if Warren's asking about a physical asset that's a home. But I, I challenge people, you know, rent, living in rented accommodation is, is very different from living in a home. Um, however, coming back to that Plett family, you know, there is a way if you own it outright to maybe remortgage 50% of it and to deploy that capital back somewhere else to get a far better return. So again, long story short, it depends. Use financial models, but make sure, in my opinion, there's always a way to find creative solutions to get a better return on your investment. Excellent. I think nice Neil, argument there, but Yes. Neil, can I can I jump in there quickly? Yes, you can. So so Warren Warren asks a really good question, and it's it's a dilemma that, that a lot of people face. And the reason they face it is because people intrinsically, or many of them, they like property. Property's got a tangibility to it that people are drawn to, gives them some comfort. But many years ago, I did an exercise in terms of owning physical property versus investing your capital. Now this is, this is what I would, I would say, and this is what I talk to a lot about people, is if you want to be an asset builder, i.e. you want to own a lot of physical property, then by all means go for it because you're gonna, if you're gearing it to, an, to a certain extent and the renting of the property is gonna give you, gonna at least cover those expenses and you build up that asset base, you can build up a really good portfolio for yourself over time that's going to have value but you have to be committed to building getting it to a critical mass and that critical math, mass is anything from five to six properties anything less than that i don't think according to my numbers is really worth it which is why if i can jump in again to to mention what Warren is saying why are we fitting into such a niche sector because we're giving people with an appetite for property exposure to the property sector without actually owning the asset. So they're getting much better returns, better yields over a shorter space of time, but still have that excitement about being in property. I'd add to that, Nick. Yep. I'd add to that the hassle factor. 
So I've been a buy-to-let investor in South Africa. I've owned a lot of properties um, here. And when I looked at my, like, my residential buy-to-let apartments and I looked at the returns I was getting, the returns were really low and the hassles were really high. <laughs> and then when I looked at the alternative investments, be it investing in something like yourself or overseas, it doesn't matter, but where it's, it's more passive, um, my returns were far higher and my hassle was far lower. And if I've learned one thing from people, they're looking to try and simplify their lives. And, you know, in the buy to lead environment here in South Africa, it really is a challenge. You know, I don't care if you've got a management agent, it, it, it is hard. <laughs> you know, you've got constant bloody toilets broken and maintenance and this and that. Whereas something like yourself, locally or internationally, is much more of a passive investment. You get a better return with a lot less headache and, and, and ultimately less hassle, which a lot of people are looking for in their life. Uh, absolutely. And I want to come back to some of the questions. I know we, I am conscious of time, guys, and I'm prepared to get through all these questions because our audience is still here. They're supporting us. You are at the great real estate debate between uh, Nick and Scott, and they've given some fantastic arguments on both sides uh, to invest uh, both locally and offshore. So, Nick, Scott brought up the whole Evergrande uh, story, which is a massive international developer. A question came from uh, the attendees there. In terms of how does Opportunity Private Capital do their due diligence on the developers? You just need to unmute yourself, Nick. <laughs> Here we go. Um, okay, so that's a, that's a fundamentally good question. And... To answer, I don't know who asked the question. I don't think you mentioned the name, Neil. There's no yeah. name. There's no name. Okay. The, the, yeah. If, if, you go, if you go back to my presentation, you'll see that we are now part of the entire... Oh, it's, it's from, uh, from Francis. Sorry, it's Francis. Yeah. yeah. So, Francis, we, 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 we are part of the entire development value chain, from funding to development to construction to sales. And why I say that, in our early days, we funded other developers per se, and we recognize the fact that we had no control over the outcome for our investors. So that's why we have now over the years evolved to a group of companies where it's it's end-to-end -end control and involvement by similar role players, which takes out which takes out the um, the risk of of other developers. So to answer your question, we now are in the, in the comfortable capacity of being able to do the due diligence, not on external developers, but on the projects themselves. So a, a professional team is able to identify the right projects in the right areas that we can exit at the right prices and thus give investors a decent product. Excellent. Uh, if, I understand it, if I understand it correctly, sorry to be a little bit more direct and give you the five second answer, but Nick is the developer. He's not doing a, a due diligence on someone else, but they're doing the due diligence themselves. So where I look at it from our perspective, we would be doing a due diligence on opportunity and opportunity would be doing a due diligence on the, on the investment, but they are the developer. They are the partner on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's, it's really a, the way I see it is invest alongside the developer opportunity, yeah. which uh, I well, think well, is... Well, well, Neil, I want, to, I want to bring something out. You know, there's a guy, I know that you've followed Tony Robbins for many years. And his, his, you know, one of his greatest gifts is if you want to be successful, copy successful people. And I, I actually think we can take that to another level now with technology. If you want to be successful, you know, it, partner with successful people. So what I mean by that is that Nowadays, you can invest in Tesla and invest alongside, you know, Elon Musk equally with, with um, if you don't know that much about property or you're not a developer or whatever, but you want to be, why not partner with Nick and the team? Why not partner with high caliber partners in, you know, John Robbie in Portugal or, or the likes of the Feldman Group in America? And you don't have to go and do it all yourself anymore. You don't have to learn it all. You don't have to go and read all the books and go on the, all the courses. Just partner with people that have been doing it 10, 20, 30 years, and you're going to get far better results with less risk. Excellent. Uh, Scott, well, so, so that's a really good point. So Neil, I just want to I just want to point out something else Scott mentioned in his in his early early discussion was the fact that um, he mentioned vested interest, and that's 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 vital in, in my opinion. So Scott, on Scott's on the Wealth Migrate platform, they've got a bunch of guys who um, have a vested interest in the execution of the investment returns. Like us, 
we have a vested interest. So in other words, it's not a case of just plonking an investment idea to investors and hoping for the best and, and then the asset manager gets his fees. We're all in it together. So it's, it's in a sense, it's a win-win for, for all parties. Okay. Gentlemen, I'm just uh, very uh, conscious of time. So what I'm going to ask is uh, for each of you, because look, this is an opportunity for somebody to, to invest, uh, certainly with Opportunity Private Capital's product, which Nick put across very nicely. And uh, so obviously this is an opportunity to take action. So Nick, we're going to give you that opportunity to wrap up in your wrap up to maybe end off with that opportunity for our uh, attendees that have come today. And Scott, certainly from your side, and maybe you want to, you know, pull all the sort of thoughts that, and the discussion of the great debate. And I think, you know, we could carry on for another hour, maybe two hours <laughs> with this debate. But I think some of the, the, the points that have come out have been really fundamentally good um, and uh, and I think certainly from an investor perspective, it's, it's stuff which they could implement almost immediately. And that's why we say take action now um, and, you know, invest alongside the people that know what they're doing. So, Scott, maybe give us your two or three minute wrap up and, uh, and, and maybe I'll give you an extra minute or two. And certainly to Nick for you and, uh, and uh, in closing comments. Yeah, I think I think there's three things that are that are critically important that I'll get across. The first is Warren Buffett always says the number one principle of investing is don't lose your capital. Number two lesson is refer to lesson number one. So for me, safety comes first. It's about wealth protection. And you know, when one looks at wealth protection, I think that diversification comes into that as well. So don't get me wrong, I'm not for or against South Africa, I'm not for or against America, I'm not for or against England. I'm not for against Australia, but I am for against diversification and wealth protection. And one of the best ways to protect your wealth is to be diversified and not have all your eggs in one basket. So that's the first thing. The second thing that is critically important is income. And, uh, you know, when you look at the likes of an opportunity investment, it is producing you with an income, whether you're investing internationally, it's the same thing. You know, my opinion, the way to shelter yourself through any economic crisis or whatever you want to call it is income the wealthiest people don't invest for capital growth they invest for income and um and it's really really something that is important for people to understand middle class people focus on on capital growth and wealthy people focus on income so really that's something that is critically important to take into account and the third one that 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 i think is is changing and has changed all of us uh, through covid Again, go and read those two articles. I've, I've shown you both the REIT one. I've put them in the channel link. I don't know, Neil, what you'll do for the recorded people, but um, there's two great articles there, both on the REITs and, and where the future of REITs are going and on the future of technology. Technology is changing uh, the real estate industry. You know, it's the oldest industry in the world, the most archaic industry in the world. There's only one other industry that's older, and I won't go into details of what that is. And um, but it's but it's 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 time for technology to really come into the space and to make it safer and simpler for investors and a lot more accessible. And whether it's next opportunities in the Western Cape, which I again I you know I like the niche focus that they're doing. I like the income that they're doing. I like the capital protection that they've got in place. And I love those graphs on the Western Cape, which I'm definitely going to be following up with, with Nick um, on. But, you know, equally, I think that as investors, um, you know, even 100,000 Rand sometimes can be a lot of money. As Nick says, if you want to go and buy a house mm. in London, you need mm. a couple of hundred thousand pounds, you know, and, and I think exactly. now that that's completely changed. And, and so mm. my last comment to everyone is you have no excuse anymore because with platforms you can get access. Um, but also remember that technology is an enabler. It is not a fix all. And all the important things that we've spoken about today, due diligence, economic cycles, the quality of the partner, protecting your capital income, nothing changes with technology. You still got to have good partners. You still got to have due diligence. Otherwise you will make mistakes and you will lose money. Wonderful. I think it's a great way to end off, Scott. And uh, and I see there's a few comments here from the audience. I'd love to see Opportunity Private Capitals on the Wealth Migrate platform, in fact, or the Wealth Point platform. Um, and certainly you're going to have real estate investor. We, we're partnering and we can actually mention that, Scott. Uh, the, the launch is imminent uh, with uh, as a white label product. So certainly 
um, is that opportunity. But great, thanks for your input there, Scott. Don't disappear quite yet. Uh, the audience has a lot of unanswered questions and uh, for the panelists. And uh, But what we will do is I'm going to suggest you make contact uh, with them. And obviously, those that have requested on the poll to so make contact you know, either with Nick and with Scott, we will send that information through. So finally, Nick, it's over to you. You've got the last word, you've got the final say. And I think certainly you want to get people to, to take action. You've given an extremely convincing argument today and very difficult to, to, to actually dispute. So in the final part of the real estate debate, Nick, give us your, your final thoughts and uh, the take action for the investors out there. Yeah, so Neil, I, I tell you why I've, I've actually loved this session was because of exactly that. There are actionable things to do. There's nothing, you know, it frustrates me terribly with, you know, you go through and you listen to a talk or something, but you don't get anything out of it. Here, as Scott says, there's no excuse. And for once, Scott and I are, well, we're, we're actually agreeing on a few things. And let me elaborate <laughs> on that. So the first one is, in terms of diversification, heck, we've got... With us, you can invest from 100,000 Rand at 14% per annum. You invest higher, you get a higher return. Those are fixed returns, which are which you'll get back in, in around a year's time, which is it was not too long to wait. But at the same time, you can diversify by going to Wealth Migrate and investing in one of the opportunities there. So there's there's so much here for people to latch on to. It's pretty amazing. Um, Scott mentioned a couple of things which I was going to mention anyway. Capital protection. Our entire structure is predicated upon capital protection, which is why it's only investor funded so that they get all the capital protection. Scott mentioned that it's part of wealth preservation. So I would like to just implore people to engage. They've got opportunities here to engage. They're not too prohibitive from an entry level point of view. There's some that are yes in dollars, et cetera, and some in rands and guys, there are some really good opportunities here. Offshore, but especially in the Western Cape, we're bullish about the Western Cape. It is going to be the place where the niche sector is going to perform well. How do people reach out to you, Nick, in, in finality? For those um, that have not requested to be in touch with you. So the easy, easiest place to go, Neil, is probably our website, <laughs> which is okay. www.opportunity.co.za. Our office number in Cape Town is 021 nine one nine double nine double four which is and i'll repeat that nine one nine double nine double four in cape town um and and that's it it's as easy as that um and if, maybe if, if scott decides to put us yes. in the great platform we can <laughs> we can be reached there as well good scott so you want to just end off with how people can reach out to you i know people have requested so just quickly in finality <laughs> yep so well wildmigrate.com so the word wealthmigrate.com um, should be, just Google it. Awesome. Um, and if Great you stuff. To, if you want to speak to me personally, uh, without being arrogant, but uh, just Google Scott Picken, like chicken with a P. Um, I'm, on the, I'm on all the social media platforms and whatever. I love, I love to engage. You know, I think, I think the world is changing. And, and probably the thing I'm most passionate about is that is that we can enable the 99% to be able to invest like the top 1% using technology. And Neil, to you and your team, I love these debates because I think it's engaging people's brains and giving yep. them the self-belief and the knowledge. And those are the two most important things before we start worrying about investment. Exactly. Scott Pickens, CEO of Global Wealth Group and uh, Nick Morgan, he's CEO of Opportunity Private Capital. Thank you very much, James, for your valuable contribution today. I think it's been fantastic. To our audience, thank you for your patience. Thank you for joining us and, uh, and your participation today. We hope that you enjoyed it and you've got value and I encourage you to engage with Nick and Scott. And uh, for those of you who requested to be contacted by the panelists, we will ensure that they reach out to you. Before you go, I need to give you some very important info and dates and reminders for our next webinars. They're just not to be missed for the rest of 2021. It's almost a webinar week. Sometimes it's two a week. Next week is how to invest in Mauritius property and get a residence by investment option. And, uh, and then, of course, on Thursday, 
Uh, the 14th of October, it's Discover and Invest Belleville Conference. And that's where Nick comes from. He's in the Belleville area. That's where his office is. Come to Belleville and see why. Um, and so that'll be on our new 3D spatial web platform. And uh, this conference is by special invite only and on request. And if you are interested, then just email us at info at remag, and we will put you on that special invite list. On Wednesday, the 20th of October is our third and final very popular two-hour property management masterclass, specifically for investors, estate agents, brokers, property managers, and body corporates. In fact, Scott brought up the whole toilet issues and the property management issues. And let me tell you what, they've got more sophisticated systems. It's a free event. You click on the link below to join that one. And then on Thursday, the 21st of October is our How to Invest in UK Property Without Living in the UK. And it's not in London. <laughs> and even if you have a South African passport. So this is also a free event. And you click on the link that, below. That's the, best, that, that's the best part is not having to live in the UK. I lived there for nine years and it's getting cold now. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and it's uh, got no petrol. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that's even worse. I mean, <laughs> that tube must be packed up. <laughs> so Thursday, the 11th of November from 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock is our annual Real Estate Investor Ruder Property Forum. And that's where we unpack the future of the South African economy, the commercial and the residential, residential markets in South Africa. This event is a paid event. And tickets are only 399 Rand per attendee. It includes an invite the week later to our REI Rota networking event. And that's going to be on our new digital 3D spatial web event platform on Thursday, 18th of November from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And you just put, click on that link below to make your booking. And, uh, and there are going to be some more additional pending webinars for 2021, which we'll notify you shortly. And, uh, but I want to thank you all, and I want to thank our panelists. I think it's been a fantastic debate. I think we've seen some wonderful ideas and, most importantly, investment opportunities and also real insight and uh, intelligence in terms of where we put our money in real estate. So thank you all once again for joining REI Talk Investment Webinar today. We look forward to seeing you next week at the same time, and I'd like to end off with this inspirational quote. And it's a general one. Be kind. For everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. And I attribute that both to Robin Williams and to philosopher Plato. So, point is, stay positive. Better days are on their way. And on that note, this is Neil Peterson of Real Estate Investors signing out. Stay safe and successful investing. We see you soon.